So good. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Public Information Center for the East London Link Phase 1. My name is Andrea Rosebra, and I'm a manager with our communications division at the City of London. I will be your host for today's meeting and the moderator for the Q&A session. I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to participate today, including Ward 4 Councillor Jesse Helmer, who has also joined to observe today's meeting. So thank you all for being here. Before we get started, I'll just let you all know that we are recording this meeting and a copy of it will be posted on our webpage on the city's Get Involved site at getinvolved.london.ca slash East London link and we'll send that out to you and you'll see that link on our website or on the presentation later on. If you lose internet connection at any time during this presentation, just be assured it's fine. You can rejoin at any time. It doesn't disrupt things or you could watch the recording later as well. And you can also reach us um, at our email if you require some assistance. It's eastlinenlink at london.ca. We look forward to taking your questions and comments today. Uh, just before we get started, I'll go over a bit of engagement um, 101 here. We've got um, the project team here with us who will be sharing a presentation uh, to update you on the East London Link project. And that will be followed by a Q&A session at the end. And just a uh, uh, to maintain the stability of the Zoom platform this evening, we've disabled video and microphone for participants for the duration of the presentation and question and answer period. And so to send us your questions or comments, we just ask that you use the Q&A button that's on your screen. Uh, this button is located, if you look at the bottom area of your screen, there's a, a, a speech bubble icon and some text that says Q&A. If you'd like to submit a question or comment at any time in the presentation, just send it on through and we'll deal with all of those at the end of the presentation. Um, and just to keep things streamlined, there is a chat function, but that's been disabled as well, uh, just to keep things focused in the Q&A area. Uh, if you're on the phone listening to this webinar and you have a question, uh, first of all, welcome. You can send that question through to the East London Link um, email address I listed. It's eastlondonlink at london.ca. And if you have a question, but you're not comfortable asking it in this forum uh, while we're recording, you are welcome to contact the project team after the meeting and we'll of course be in touch with you. Um, we've enabled closed captions for this meeting. While the system generally does a pretty good job of capturing what's being said, errors do occur. So if you need any clarification for anything that's being presented tonight, just feel free to reach out to us. And with that, I'll now pass it over to Jenny Dan. She is the Director of Construction and Infrastructure Services with the City of London. Jenny, over to you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so as Andrea just introduced me, I'm Jenny Dan, and I'm, I'm recently in the new role of Director of Construction and Infrastructure Services with the City of London. So before we begin this meeting, we acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Attawandaran, Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, and the Lenapewak peoples who have long-standing relationships to the water, land, and region of southwestern Ontario. The local First Nation communities of this area include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation. Additionally, there is a growing urban Indigenous population who make the City of London home. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations of Turtle Island. Now, I've had a chance to speak with lots of folks over the course of planning for this project, and I look forward to continuing to work with you and the project team in the months ahead. As Andrea mentioned, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the project website for those who are not able to attend or if you'd like to watch it again later. This evening, we have representatives from the City of London, ACOM, and together we're going to be providing a project update as well as presenting the plans for construction and what you can expect for phase one of the East London Link. The purpose of this webinar is for our team to be able to present designs for the East London Link Phase 1 along King Street from Wellington Street up to Lyle Street, present concepts for the bus stations and streetscapes, share more about the plans for construction and how we'll be mitigating construction impacts, and provide an opportunity for you to participate in a Q&A session. Now on to the presentation. So um, I'm not the only one that's going to be sharing information with you tonight. We also have joining us Ted Koza, who's the Division Manager for Major Projects with the City of London. Rick Bogart is a Senior Landscape Architect with ACOM. 
And this evening, we also have Katie Burns, who's the Director of Planning for LTC, and Jeffrey Kelso, representing ACOM. Now, in this project, ACOM and Dillon Consultant Consulting have part partnered as our consultants for the project. And for phase one, ACOM is leading the design. So that's why we have Jeff here to help us with any detailed questions. Katie will also be participating in the Q&A at, at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand it over to Ted Koza, Division Manager for Major Projects. And that's the team that's responsible for planning and implementing the city's rapid transit projects. Ted? Uh, thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ted Koza, and I'm the Division Manager for the Major Projects Office. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Major Projects team. Today, I'll be giving a presentation uh, based on the East, on the East London Link Phase 1 project from Wellington to Lyle Street. I'll also provide details on design, what we can expect from construction, and construction staging and mitigation. Uh, rapid transit benefits. Um, first off, I'd like to begin by providing a bit of background on rapid transit in London. The City of London completed a large environmental assessment that looked at the citywide rapid transit network. With the environmental assessment completed for the whole system, we then broke it into five components and Council prioritized implementing three of them to connect downtown to the east and south ends of the city. Rapid transit will add new transit lanes, improve transit capacity and reliability, add new street surfacing and streetscapes, as well as other urban design improvements, and uh, replace aging infrastructure, and of course, add intelligent traffic signals for better traffic flow. Uh, next slide, please. The three major, tra major, major trans rapid transit projects that Council has prioritized are the downtown loop, the Eastern Corridor, which is also called the East London Link, and the Wellington Gateway to the south. These three projects alone represent approximately $270 million worth of work, which includes federal and provincial funding. We started the engineering design work for all three projects and the approximate timelines are 2021 to 2023 for the downtown loop, which we are currently constructing phase one of King Street between Rideout and Wellington. 2022 to 24 is the East London link, which, we are, which is what we're presenting tonight. And 2023 to 2026 is for the Wellington Gateway. Once built, the new rapid transit service will, oper will be operated by the LTC as part of the existing public transit system with the same fare. As we build these projects, we'll be implementing transit only lanes above ground, along with new street surfacing and streetscapes and urban design improvements, while also replacing aging underground infrastructure. Next slide, please. The downtown loop. Uh, the downtown loop will run buses and transit only lanes along Wellington Street. Queens Avenue, Rideout Street, and King Street. The transit stops will be located at, along King Street at Talbot and Wellington. And in this drawing, you can see along King Street, the circles, those delineate the actual stops along the corridors. The stops will be also located on Wellington Street at King Street. Yep, thank you, Andrea. And on Queens Avenue, we have a stop at Clarence and a stop at Rideout Street. These stops will be used by both rapid transit and local buses. The project will include streetscape enhancement, new street lights, upgrades of traffic signals, as well as a place replacing aging water mains and sewers. The downtown loop is being constructed in three phases. Phase one being King Street between Rideout and Wellington. That's what we're constructing this year. Phase two is, this pro uh, is uh, the, the project we have been constructing 2022, which is Queens Avenue to Rideout Street. And phase three is Wellington Street in 2023, <clears throat> excuse me, and that extends basically from Queen to just north of York Street. Uh, next slide, please. Downtown Loop Phase 1 construction. First, I'd like to provide a little update on Downtown Loop Phase 1 construction that is currently underway on King Street. Works include full road reconstruction to incorporate rapid transit dedicated lanes, including new asphalt, sewer, and water main improvements, boulevard enhancements, and curb and gutter and sidewalks. Currently in phase one of the downtown loop, we're nearing completion with surface asphalt and pavement markings between Rideout and Richmond. Station and concrete bus pads are currently being struck, constructed at the Talbot station. New city and utility infrastructure is being installed between Richmond and Wellington. Existing concrete removals are being undertaken at Richmond between Richmond and Wellington. And new curb and gutter construction is being taking place right now between Richmond and Clarence. Next slide, please. 
Okay, we'll talk a little bit Wellington Gateway here. Um, this, this slide provides an overview of the full length of the Wellington Gateway project, extending from downtown, connecting at the couplet. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. So it connects at the downtown at the loop at York Street and extends southerly along Wellington to Exeter Road, passing by Victoria Hospital, commercial areas, past White Oaks Mall, and eventually terminating at the south end at a potential park and ride facility. We're in the early stages of the design processes of this corridor. Similar to the East London Link, this project has also been broken into approximately four design segments, which is currently being designed by the same consul three consultants on our design team. This project is similar in length to that of the East London Link, so we'll be moving quickly through the preliminary design and into detailed design in order to prepare for the first stage of construction in 2023. Similar to other projects, there are many moving parts, uh, utility upgrades, property needs, and as a result, the overall construction stage and strategy will be developed taking these needs into consideration and looking for ways to advance areas along the corridor to construct as efficiently as possible. More information will be released about the overall design and construction schedule in the near future. Next slide, please. Okay, the East London link. Um, this is the project we're, we're updating you folks on today. And uh, the project will revitalize more than six kilometers from downtown to Fanshawe College. Add rapid transit and transportation improvements, including transit links to the city's Eastern industrial employment areas, while also replacing and repairing aging sewers and water mains. This project has received funding, funding commitments from the, the government of Canada and the province of Ontario to support 10 transit and transit supportive projects. The slide provides an overview of the full length of the East London Link project, extending from downtown, connecting at the downtown loop at Wellington. Thanks, Andrea. And extending easterly along King Street to Ontario, connecting to Dundas Street, along Dundas to Highbury, north to Oxford Street, and then finally to Fanshawe College. Construction of this project is planned to start in the spring of 2022. The overall construction staging strategy is being developed, but the first stage of construction planned for King Street is Wellington to Lyle. We're trying to complete as much of King Street as possible next year with the easterly limit still being refined as we work through coordinating utilities, relocations, and property needs. Construction of the balance of the project is planned over the following three years. A multi-stage approach will be implemented for this project to balance efficient construction with transportation impacts and it's anticipated that construction will continue until December 2024 with limited carryover work into the spring of 2025. Now let's take a closer look at block by block improvements planned for the first part of East London Link along King Street, namely between Wellington and Lyle Street. Next slide, please. I'll just give a quick overview before I get into the actual corridor. Um, construction of the East London Link phase one has been broken down to construction st stages, similar to how phase one of the downtown loop is being constructed along King Street between Rideout and Wellington. The project team is still working through final details and coordination and construction stages will be shared once available. Although new transit lane only lanes will improve transit capacity and reliability, new street surfacing and streetscapes will go a long way to making this eastern stretch of King Street something we can all be proud of. More than half of this work is happening underground. The city will be, place, will be replacing aging underground infrastructure, sewers, water mains, and London hydro upgrades, and coordinating all this work to, while coordinating all this work to minimize disruptions to area residents, businesses, and traffic. Next slide, please. Okay, Wellington to Waterloo Street. Uh, King Street East from Wellington to Lyle will be transformed from one-way eastbound traffic to two-way traffic with a westbound bus only lane. Pedestrians and vehicle traffic will have to become familiar with this new operation in which users will need to look both ways before crossing this section of King Street. Eastbound traffic will need to become familiar with the north curb lane of King Street being used as a contraflow bus lane for contraflow bus lane traffic. Signage will be installed to advise of these changes as well as pavement markings, temporary traffic control devices. We're considering things such as flexible delineators, delineators um, and other, another, uh, uh, traffic uh, modes are being planned and considered to, to define this change in traffic movement. Over the next few slides, I'll focus on the technical details for each block along King Street from Wellington to Lyle. And later in the presentation, Rick from AECOM will share an update on streetscapes. Now let's take a look at the first block, Wellington to Waterloo Street. 
In this rendering, you can see the proposed design for this section. The red markings represent the dedicated lanes for buses, of which you'll see more in the next few slides. Um, we'll, maybe we'll just go over it really quickly. So the, the red lanes for buses we have on the north side where, the, where Andrea is right now. That is gonna be the West Contraflow westbound traffic dedicated bus lane. That's along the north curb. As we go to the southern curb, that's gonna be the dedicated bus lane for eastbound traffic. Um, I'll go into more details about the hash marks on these corridors, but in, on this particular schedule, on this particular drawing, you'll see how the hash marks will enable access into the various properties and, and turn movements along the corridor. Starting with the east, starting where the East London Link intersects the downtown loop at Wellington Street, you'll see the beginning of road construction and in the, in the introduction of new landscaping elements. Before road construction, there'll be lots of infrastructure upgrades happening underground, including sanitary and storm sewer construction, a part of a, sor a sewer separation project and some water main place and replacements, as well as uh, London Hydro upgrades. The city is working with impact of property owners and business owners to determine best configuration for business access and loading zones during to construction. Now, I'll just spend a few moments on this drawing before you go on to the next slide, but uh, if you look in the cross section here in the top left corner, Perfect. Um, it shows you basically at the at the very far left, we see the access road in this drawing. It's the access road that goes into the Hilton Hotel. As you go into the corridor King Street proper, we have the contraflow buses. The one westbound bus is what we're showing right there. Yes, thank you. And then you have the two lanes of general purpose traffic, eastbound. And then we have the eastbound rapid transit bus lane for bus traffic. And as we extend further to the east, there's a turn lane dedicated right turn lane onto Waterloo off of King. Okay, let's maybe carry on to the next slide and we'll describe a little more detail about the lane, the lane painting that's gonna occur here. Um, so let's take a few minutes to talk about uh, some of the different uh, illustrations here. The first one on the left is bus only image and it indicates that only buses are permitted in this lane. The second image hash lines and it indicates that vehicles are permitted to cross the bus route for driveway access or enter right-hand turning lanes along the corridor. The third illustration indicates through lane for buses and a right-hand turn lane for vehicles. And the last illustration shows and indicates a shared through lane for buses and right turn lane for vehicles. So that's a shared configuration. I'll point them out as we carry on with the different uh, slides. The pavement markings combined with the road signs and traffic signals are essential to give road users important information about the direction of traffic and where they may and may not travel. We recognize that this is new for all of us and the need for educational campaigns and resources before, during and after rapid transit begins to operate in the city. Next slide, please. Okay, now we'll focus on Waterloo to Colburn. Moving along King Street, we cross Waterloo. And you can see some more of the tree, new trees and landscaping that will be installed along the north side of the street adjacent to YMCA. As you'll see later in the presentation, we also know there needs to be a balance between the various modes of transportation. And you'll see that the pavement markings in red for dedicated bus lanes aren't continuous. We want to give buses the priority in curb lanes while allowing enough space to enable safe travel of pedestrians, cars and buses. We know that businesses in the area are excited about the improvements that will be made, but also apprehensive about the necessary construction intent to get it on. We'll all, we'll already be in, we've already been in touch with most of the property owners and businesses in this segment to understand their needs and to talk about the construction's impacts. We're going to keep those lines of communication open throughout the construction process. Uh, I'll just go over a couple more details of this plan drawing here. So on this drawing, you see, again, we have the two general purpose lanes of eastbound traffic. That's between the bus lanes. We again on the on the south curb we have the eastbound dedicated bus lane. On the north curb, along the north curb, we have the westbound contraflow bus lane. As you can see in this rendering, we we also we don't we won't be painting throughout the entire lane bus lanes, but we'll be looking at adding paint to more localized points of conflict, those kind of areas, just to so people know that once they pull into these corridors they'll know that where the bus lane exists and the general purpose lanes uh, are. Um, as we go along this, uh, I guess, Andrew, as you, as you head east along this corridor, you'll see an example of where there's a dedicated right through turn lane with a bus lane. And this is an example of where a car will share that traffic lane with buses, as in this case, as they turn right onto Colburn. Okay, next slide. 
we'll talk about Colburn to Burwell Street. Between Colbert and Burwell, we see stations on the north and sides, south sides of King Street, and those are indicated by the blue pads, and those are the actual bus pad, proposed bus pad locations. We're going to take a look at station and stop designs a bit later, but for now, you'll just see, we will, as we go through these different plans, you'll see where the proposed locations are in blue. In addition to some of the new trees planted on the block, you'll see several new street lighting elements and, and the ways that we propose to enhance safety as the, as the overall streetscape. There's also a 3D rendering of Colburn Station a bit late in the presentation. That'll give you an even better sense of what this block will look like when finished. Um, I'll just go over the plan view here really quickly with Andrea. And as we cross over along King Street over Colburn, you'll notice that it goes from two lanes of general purpose traffic to one lane of general purpose traffic. So that's the big change at this location. Again, along the south curb, we have the eastbound buses. And the north curb, we have the westbound buses. And again, the hashing shows and indicates where the access points are into the different areas along the corridors. Um, okay, I guess we can carry on to the next slide and that's gonna be Burwell to Maitland Street. So continuing east, um, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the sidewalks. Part of the balance that we're trying to achieve with this project also means improving walkability along King Street. You'll see a new two meter concrete sidewalk as well as a grass boulevard between the sidewalk and the street. That helps improve safety as well as adding to the overall streetscape. And again, in this corridor, it's a relatively short block, but we have, uh, and if you look at the top left, left illustration there, you'll see how we have one lane of, of eastbound general purpose traffic, as well as the two bus, bus lanes, one contraflow, one eastbound on the north south curb, and one westbound on the north curb. In this case, again, we have the hashings where you have access to properties, and on the east side of the illustration, you see where the cars are enabled are, are allowed to turn uh, right onto Maitland off of King Street. Okay, so let's carry on to the next slide, please. And we're going Maitland to William. Underground work to replace sewers and localized water mains continues in this section. There will also be some work by London Hydro to replace overhead lines in the area. Um, we, we've talked about how this project will improve safety, but please recognize that safety during construction is also a first priority for us and, and our design and construction partners. Um, along this corridor, you'll see as well that, that it's a relatively long block, but we again, we have a one lane of general purpose traffic, the contraflow buses, the painting of the red line is, is more localized and, and basically adjacent to those points of conflict or at the intersections. Um, and again, this intersection, we have a right-hand turn shared with the transit dedicated lane. Okay, next slide, please. And we'll carry on to William to Adelaide Street. And crossing William, we come across, crossing Adelaide and coming on to Adelaide, you'll see that the London Police, London, London Police Service building to the north. We've been working closely with the, the police services to minimize those impacts of construction with police services. Given that this is a major intersection, there's quite a bit of sewer, water, main and hydro work to be done. But before that's even before we start the road work uh, construction as well as a bus platform construction and landscaping. So it's a, it's a pretty intensive corridor section that will be worked upon. Um, again, if we look at the plan view, we have at the Western side, we have one lane of general purpose traffic and the contraflow bus lanes, eastbound on the south curb and northbound, westbound on the north curb. As we head further east along the corridor, you'll see that we have a dedicated right turn lane adjacent to the, uh, the transit lane. And in this particular case, we'd, we'd have at the intersection, transit, the transit would have priority through intersection controls and they'd be advanced through the intersection before the right-hand turn vehicles would be able to make that move south on Adelaide Street. So in addition to some of the, 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 the underground work that we're doing the surface work, there's a lot of traffic control and signalization work that needs to happen with this particular project. If we can carry on to the next slide, please, Andrea. And now we're looking at Adelaide Street to Lyle Street. And you'll see uh, another bus stop here on, the, on the, uh, the north and east corner, but the westbound bus stop in Adelaide is east of the intersection. We know that this is gonna be a popular given the proximity to the old East Village. And we're excited about opportunities to integrate some of the design elements happening along Dundas Street into our King Street work. By looking for those points of alignment, we will create a rich sense of place through the area and better connect neighborhoods through design as well as transit. And I think 
be what I'll show as well too is that we again we have this uh, it's one lane of general eastbound purpose traffic that goes through this this corridor, as well as the eastbound bus dedicated bus lane on the, the south curb and the westbound dedicated bus lane on the uh, the north along the north curb. And I think I will turn it over to Rick Bogart from ACOM and he'll present an update on the streetscapes for phase one of the project. Great, thanks Ted. So through the environmental assessment process, uh, the city heard a number of comments and feedback from the London community on how the rapid transit projects have transformative potential to create um, vibrant streetscapes that not only provide that higher quality of design and aesthetic, but the opportunity to address how the streetscape functions and how it can cater to all users. So based on these comments, um, a number of commitments were made and we are fulfilling these as we move through the design. Uh, these include um, station platforms that are visually uh, distinct from the sidewalk on the road, uh, improved si uh, crosswalks with enough time for all to cross, uh, well-lit areas, uh, wider sidewalks, the inclusion of unique community identity in the design, um, placing emphasis on preserving trees and are more uh, adding more where feasible <clears throat> and where it makes sense. And where it makes sense is the presence of um, underground utilities and then access to sufficient um, soil. Uh, comfortable seating, <clears throat> uh, as well as room for wheelchairs and consideration for accessibility when crossing, uh, choosing materials. Um, the foundation of the proposed design for the East London Link Rapid Transit Streetscapes is based on four guiding design principles. Uh, these principles uh, include the balanced multimodal transportation um, and the, an enhanced and balanced approach uh, to the integrating the mobility for transit users, pedestrians and automobiles. Um, provide a wider pedestrian corridors through expanded sidewalks where space allows. And as uh, Ted mentioned <clears throat> uh, in the upper left uh, corner of the uh, guiding principles, um, of the balanced multimodal transportation is a bird's eye view perspective of uh, King Street. I uh, believe this is at Colburn looking east. Um, then the uh, be environmentally resilient uh, is incorporating new street trees and retaining existing trees where we can. Um, using sustainable materials and sourcing local material where possible. Updating the lighting to use luminaires that reduce light pollution and provide new recycling and trash receptacles, which are identified in the upper right uh, corner of the uh, slide. Then living a uh, lively sense of place. So develop a contemporary and unified design style that will not only meet the city's new design standard, but will blend the distinct <clears throat> design language of other downtown and old East Village streetscapes. Um, update the existing street furniture and wayfinding features so that it is consistent with other streetscapes. And the last component is provide the distinct urban design enhancements. So enhanced cro uh, pedestrian crossings at station stops and clustering the site furnishings <coughs> at intersections or at landmark locations along that corridor. Those are identified in the lower left uh, part of this uh, slide. And the last principle is be safe for all users. So provide a barrier free streetscape design allowing pedestrians to have clear paths of travel free from obstructions. Uh, integrating accessibility design elements, such as detectable warning plates that meet current accessibility standards at all pedestrian crossings, um, providing sodded boulevard or a textural and tonal difference of paving material between the road curb and the main uh, path of travel. And the last one is to follow the principles of crime prevention through environmental design, SEPTED. So examples of this are visible stops and improving the lighting. So the lower uh, right uh, slide, um, lower right quadrant of the slide uh, that you see identify those elements, the tonal difference in the sidewalk um, and the, uh, uh, the uh, sodded boulevard and the truncated domes for the crosswalks. And I'll flip it back to you, Andrea. Thanks, I'm actually gonna pass it over to Jenny now to talk about stops and stations. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we'd like to take this opportunity to next update you on the status of our concepts for the rapid transit stops. In designing these transit stops, the team considered the input that was received from the public and key stakeholders during the environmental assessment process and prioritized features that the public and transit users told us were important to them. So building on that input, the design team has incorporated the following elements. So uh, a recognizable design that can be applied consistently across all RT projects, 
platforms that are big enough to be able to accommodate anticipated passenger loads. Uh, some other elements of the design have incorporated in durable anti-graffiti materials, um, design accessibility with tactile warning plates and adequate space for wheelchairs, walkers, and mobility devices, shelters that protect from the elements and have regard for rider safety, convenience, and wayfinding. And we've also, we're planning to include some customizable space within the stock designs that can provide a canvas where we can help reflect the local neighborhood where it makes sense and where that's possible. Uh, for example, on the East London Link, there will be two stops at either end of the Old East Village, one at the intersection of King and Adelaide and another stop further east at King and Ontario Street. So as Ted mentioned, we already know that these are gonna be popular stops given that they directly serve the Old East Village. And so we're really excited about the potential opportunities to integrate some of the design elements that are happening on the Dundas Street work this year and connect that to the work that's gonna be happening on King Street next year. So we really wanna be able to look at those points of alignment so that we can kind of create that rich sense of place throughout the core and better connect our neighborhoods through design as well as through improved transit. Over the next few slides, I'll share some concepts for stop locations around the East London Link to give you a sense of how the designs are evolving as we work towards our near final design. So it's important to keep in mind, uh, these stops are all designed to be modular and they'll be scaled to fit each location, but the elements themselves will be consistent across each stop. So this slide shows the conceptual design for a typical rapid transit stop. You can see some of the elements that are common to all stops. So there's the modular passenger shelters that'll have seating, windscreens, and a glazed or tempered, uh, tempered glass roof canopy. Each of the stops will have a separate shelter bay that will house the ticket vending machine and also provide opportunities for advertising or map displays. And each stop will have a blue light station, which is an emergency intercom unit that serves as a safety and security feature. There'll be portals and or landmark features that will frame the ends of the platforms that'll help define the actual platform area, but also provide some uh, visual recognition that you'll be able to see across all RT stops. So I think we're gonna have another perspective of a stop from a different angle. Um, so again, you can kind of see the, the main shelter area and ticket vestibule, but now we've got a close up of sort of a rendering of what that ticket vestibule will look like. So you can see again, this is where we'll be housing that ticket vending machine, a map information. Uh, these will also be equipped with real time information that will be able to inform you about when your next bus is coming. So again, with the whole idea of rapid transit, the having reliable frequent service where you know that your next bus is going to, at least for the East London Link, be coming at a five minute frequency between buses during peak periods. So in that case, it's really convenient to be able to go out and know that your next bus is gonna be coming soon, but also be able to have real time information on what you can expect when you're waiting for that next bus. The environmental assessment had considered raising our height platform heights closer to the height of a typical bus floor to support riders with mobility challenges and make it easier for everyone to board the bus. So that's something that we were really thinking about at that stage. However, as we got through our detailed design, we learned about some operational changes or experiences that other municipalities were seeing where they'd gone with that raised height platform. Um, a lot of issues with damage and, and um, problems where people were still having to deploy the ramps for the buses anyways. And in a lot of cases, those cities have actually lowered their stops back to a standard curve height. So we thought, well, let's, let's just go straight to that. And there's a lot of benefits to that as well. So keeping the stop at the sidewalk level avoids the need for ramps and railings, which makes the stop itself a lot more accessible. And we know that in all cases, the bus operator will deploy the ramp for anybody that requires any mobility assistance when boarding the bus. Again, these are design concepts and all of the design elements will be determined later in the detailed process when we go through procuring and, and securing our fabricator to actually build these for us. But these are really good understanding of the, the elements and the concepts that you'll see when we do bring those forward. We recognize that it might be hard to picture some of these stop concepts based on these sort of more engineering type renderings. And so that's why we've developed some 3D visualizations of an RT stop. If you visit the East London Link Get Involved website, you can check out a 3D virtual tour of the King and Wellington stop. It's a really helpful tool to be able to kind of, you can twist it around and look at it from different angles and really kind of picture what these are gonna look like in, in real space. 
And then lastly, I wanted to show you a close up of the rendering that we have for King Street looking west from the Colburn intersection. So um, this is a new rendering for us. We recently produced this one to be able to show you what those counterflow lanes are gonna look like along King Street. Um, you can just see the end of the Colburn Street station on the, I it would be the, I'm getting bearings here, on the north, east corner of that intersection. Andrea's pointing it out with her red dot there. Um, so that's gonna be one of those typical stations. You can see the glazed roof and that shelter area. There's a bus sitting in that platform in the, in the red dedicated bus lane. So that bus there is representing where a westbound counterflow bus would be sitting as it makes its way down. You can also see um, similar to what you could see from the plans that Ted showed, how the red pavement marking for the bus lanes is really localized to those key points near intersections, decision-making points to help people understand which lane they're supposed to be in and how to navigate a road that has dedicated bus lanes. Um, I think we can maybe move on from there, Andrea, and we can now touch on cycling. So uh, I wanted to update you on a lot of the work that's been happening with the city in terms of improving our cycling infrastructure. Each year, the city is continuing to make big achievements in adding additional cycling infrastructure. And we're working to create separated bike lanes in the core that will improve connections for cyclists moving through and into downtown. So this map highlights some new in cycling infrastructure that's been added in the core over the past two years with a focus on creating an east-west spine for cyclists along Dundas Street. To the west, there will be connections to the Thames Valley Parkway multimodal path system. And to the east, Dundas Place connects to Midtown and Old East Village communities via the east-west bikeway. Once the construction on Dundas in Old East Village wraps up this construction season, cyclists will be able to continue east on Dundas along in Boulevard bike lanes on the south side of the road, separated from cars. And then next year, the city will also be building new higher order bike lanes on Queens Avenue, which will complete the couplet, allowing cyclists to travel westbound back from William where to where they can return to the Dundas bikeway. Um, so I think Andrea is kind of pointing that out as we go. So I think that's really exciting. You can see from this map, we've really got a clear, a clear spine for cyclists to use along Dundas Place. Um, it also will, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, phase two of the downtown loop is starting in 2022, and it's going to be adding north and southbound raised cycle tracks on Rideout Street, further improving connections. Uh, as we've been replacing the temporary King Street bike lane with transit only lanes, we're moving cycling onto Dundas. Uh, construction staging for the downtown loop project will ensure cycling connections are in place prior to removing the temporary King Street bike lane. And with that, I think I'll hand it back to Ted, who's going to talk to us about what we can expect during construction. Oh, thanks, Jody. That was a, a great summary on bikes. Um, I'll, I'll start with, okay, the construction phasing map. Perfect, thanks, Andrea. In, in this map, we can see the East London Link route and the proposed bus stops along King Street. And uh, I don't know if you have a pen handy, Andrea, but the, the circles along the corridors illustrate each of the stops that we're proposing. But in this map, you can see the proposed stops along King, Dundas, Highbury, and Oxford Street. And we are, will be terminated at a terminus, we'll be stopping the route at a terminus at Fanshawe College where it spins around and works its way back west. Um, the project team thoroughly considered a broad range of factors and perspectives in developing the phasing plan. The, it's a, it's a large, so we recognize it's approximately six kilometers, a relatively large stra, a stretch of roads, but we basically looked at many different factors to develop the phasing plan and the construction of the East London Link, which will run from approximately 2022 through 2024 with some carryover work in 2025. Some of the key considerations were, how can we do as much as possible to minimize disruption and maintain access for nearby property owners, residents, and businesses? How do we keep people moving through and around the area during construction, including all modes of transportation, bikes, buses, cars, um, how do we efficiently coordinate with other planned work in the area and other utilities to avoid multiple disruptions? And how do we, most importantly, how do we best achieve the project timelines and stay within budget? After reviewing all these possible, after reviewing all possible options for constructing the East London Link, including all these factors, the team is moving forward with a high level phasing plan. 
and the phasing plans and the colored respective colors are shown in this diagram. But the first phase of King Street is proposed from Wellington to Lyle in 2022. The second phase of King Street from Lyle to Ontario, Ontario to Dundas, and Dundas from Ontario to Egerton is in 2023. The third phase is 2024 and is Dundas Street from Egerton to Highbury. And the fourth phase is Highbury Avenue between Dundas and Oxford and Oxford from Highbury to Fanshawe College. These construction phases and schedules are still under review and subject to approvals. Phases two, three, and four are still in the detailed design stages and plans for construction will be shared at a future public engagement events. And I think we can move on to the next slide there. Thank you. Um, some of the main considerations that supported this approach to construction included aligning with other infrastructure and construction projects in the area. This map shows those projects that are scheduled for 2022 and the proximity to Old East Village. There will be underground work and surface work on English Street between Dundas and Queens, cycling improvement on Queens Ave between Quebec and William, and underground intersection improvements and road rebuild at the intersection of English Street and Lorne Ave. It's also important to note that the East London Link project team is working closely with, the, with the, that team constructing the Adelaide underpass and the downtown loop phase two project, that's Queens Avenue and Rideout Street. Those two projects are also scheduled in 2022, as Jenny mentioned earlier. Aligning construction of East London Link with these projects is important to help minimize disruptions and maintain traffic flow and transit operations in the area, as well as access to municipal lots. Now I will, I will hand it over to Andrew now. Thanks, Ted. So two years ago, uh, the city conducted a survey of downtown businesses who'd experienced construction in the core. And uh, we received a lot of valuable input. We heard that some of the biggest pain points were things like sidewalk and pedestrian access and vehicle and road access. And so we've been really working on those, on those uh, bits of feedback that we've been hearing and that we collected through the survey. And we heard that the best ways to keep you informed are through a combination of email notification, signage around the site, notices delivered to your door, and um, lots of in-person conversations uh, between project representatives and, and properties. Uh, we also heard some great ideas for how we could improve the way we do things, and we've put many of those in place. We'll be keeping this feedback top of mind as we work to mitigate construction project impacts um, for the East London Link. And uh, we'll be reaching out with another construction survey this year to continue improving, learning how we can improve on things. Uh, the survey results told us that timely communication with accurate information was critical in shaping people's construction experience. Um, and the city will continue to work towards a high level of communication and coordination for this project to really try and minimize and mitigate those impacts to residents and businesses as much as we can during construction. Uh, some of the key ways that we plan to do that and to support local businesses throughout construction um, include making sure that Londoners know how to reach you and that you are open during construction through very targeted strategic marketing. We'll be working closely with downtown London BIA and the Old East Village BIA to uh, support businesses during construction um, as we have for, for projects in the core already. And we're devoting a dedicated business relations resource to the project to act as a liaison between the city and individual businesses. We'll also be injecting money into the local economy through the core area construction dollars program. And that's to really encourage Londoners to continue supporting businesses through construction. Um, in addition here in these images here that you can see are some of the tools and resources that, uh, that we'll be providing such as a construction toolkit with key information on who to contact and what to expect and resources. Um, we've got wayfinding signage uh, in the second photo there um, to help guide people through the area and, uh, and also construction dollars as mentioned, there's a, a, an image of it. In addition to this, we'll be sending bi-weekly communications directly to um, everyone subscribed to the project, um, the project list. This is to ensure that everyone has the most up-to-date information about the project, uh, what's been completed in the past two weeks, what to expect, and any um, special things to note um, about the work ahead. If you haven't signed up yet to receive these updates, we really do encourage you to, if you just visit the Get Involved site, um, it's getinvolved.london.ca slash East London Link. Um, we will we'll get you on that list to make sure that you're receiving these updates. And so I'll just speak really briefly to next steps really um, this is just wanted to briefly touch on some of the upcoming milestones 
Um, right now we're in fall winter 2021. Um, unbelievable we're already here, but yes, tonight we are having the PIC um, for the East London Link. And then looking ahead, the next touch point that we'll have with you is we'll be reaching out um, um, to invite you to uh, the pre-construction meeting for phase one construction of the East London Link. And that's where we really get into the nitty gritty details of construction staging, things like traffic management, what's going to happen with garbage pickup and access loading, um, park and pickup locations, all kinds of details. So we, we really get into the weeds in that meeting. It's very, it's a very fulsome discussion. Um, and then, and then a few weeks later, we'll be kicking off construction on phase one. And I believe this is the closing out slide. Yes, I'll just close out the presentation portion of our meeting um, with this slide. And it shows a screen, uh, screen capture of the Get Involved web page uh, on the bottom right of the screen. You'll be able to see when you visit the page. Um, you can click in and have a bit of a tour of a, kind of a VR experience with one of the rapid transit stops. Um, and there's some information on here on how you can stay connected. Um, whether you live or work in the area or you just wanna learn more about the project, we really do encourage you to sign up. If you have any additional comments or questions after tonight's meeting, um, feel free to send it to us. And as we mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, we'll be posting a recording of the meeting um, to the project website tomorrow. Um, just before we kick off the Q&A portion, um, we'll remind everyone to send them into the Q&A area. I see some in there already. And uh, we look forward to getting started. Let's dive into a couple of these questions. Okay, I'm just opening it up here. Bear with me here. Okay, we have a question here about whether there will be sewer and water main work um, to be done on King Street between Waterloo and it says between Waterloo and King Street. Oh, they said sorry. I mean between Waterloo and Colborne Streets. This would be Andrea. Can you can you pull the map up that shows that section of road? Yeah, it's around, I think it's around yep. seventeen eighteen. And uh, yeah, it may take me. Sorry, yeah. everyone. Is oh, no, problem. It, no problem. I remember a previous PIC. It was loading a little bit slowly, but I think we're doing. Those are actually here. great illustrations to read from. Yeah, they are helpful. Yeah, yeah we'll stay in that area for I'm sure a few of these. Just heading on back. I can there. answer that, Ted and everyone. It's Jeff Belso from AECOM. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Brian. The answer is yes. Uh, there will be storm sewer and sanitary sewer work on King between Waterloo and Colburn as part of this project next year. There will be very limited water main work, but the sewers, both the sanitary and storm sewer, will be replaced on that block in particular. That's not to say that's the case for each block. There are some blocks where there is less sewer work than others, um, but that particular block and the block on King between Wellington and Waterloo will, uh, will also involve new uh, storm and sanitary schools. Thanks, and Jeff. Uh, service laterals to the beyond the limits of the new curb. So the, the PDCs, the private drain connections, we call them, will be replaced as, as well for, for the most part. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Jeff. We'll see if there are any follow-up questions based on that. But um, sure. um, that we have a, a comment here from someone saying that pavement markings will be critical for safety. How will this work during winter when streets may be snow covered? That's an ex excellent question. I think there's going to be a learning curve. There's no question, learning curve when the street gets actually gets uh, initiated for or open to traffic. Um, what we are looking at in the very near term is looking at some sort of signage overhead to assist with those traffics, the contraflow bus lane traffics. So we're going to have that kind of delineation for these corridors. And um, but you're absolutely right. When there's a big change like this, there's going to be a big educational component that's going to be required to help everyone who uses this corridor understand the operations. So um, you're right. Winter time will present a challenge, but ideally, um, you know, we'll look at those kind of. I spoke earlier about maybe some possible. A delineation, whether it be, you know, those, those, those little tiger tails, we call them in the asphalt. But again, this has got to be maintainable. So that's the other issue we're dealing with. But for the most part, we're looking at those kind of visual cues to assist with the, um, the, the uh, understanding of what the contraflow bus thing is going to look like along this corridor. Thanks, Ted. Okay, we have another question here from someone um, who has said, 
how will you ensure smooth passage to vehicles while construction uh, says well construction phase to businesses, especially our hotel, how will you ensure smooth passage to vehicles while construction, I'm assuming while construction is phase one is underway uh, to businesses, especially our hotel. Yeah, well, as we plan, oh, sorry, is that no, I can go, take go ahead, Jenny, go ahead. As we plan for construction, we're going to be looking at each block on a block by block basis and coming up with access plans for how we're going to manage those. And so we know that everybody's access needs are different, whether you're receiving deliveries or you have customers that are trying to reach your, your property. Um, so we'll be looking on a case by case basis and figuring out solutions. In some cases, we'll look for alternate access points, either maybe from the rear or from side streets, or if we need to, we'll be maintaining in some sections of this project, we'll be maintaining one lane of traffic at least to be able to allow vehicles to access certain points. So um, it's not a one size fits all approach, but it's definitely looking at each, each block to make sure we can ensure people get to the destinations they're trying to get to. Thanks, Jenny. We have a question from Kathy who has asked about um, parking near where she lives. Um, I was just looking on our map to double check and it's the, it's the apartment right next to just east of the um, YMCA center branch um, in that block from, from Waterloo to Colburn Street. And she asks, um, I live at 380 King Street, which will be directly affected by these changes. Parking is now severely limited by the removal of parking spaces on King. Will the rest of the parking spaces on King West of Water King West of Waterloo be removed? Uh, this actually, is, oh, sorry, that's okay. The rendering that's up right now, you can actually see that location. So um, this is a block because we have bus lanes on either curb lanes of King Street. There mm -hmm. won't be on street parking after the project's completed, uh, but we are looking to maintain access. You can see in this area, there's a bit of a loading and parking area that's on private property in front of the London Towers building where the uh, exit ramp to the 380 King comes out. That will be maintained. We won't be impacting that at all. And this is also a good opportunity to explain how currently the, the underground parking that exits 380, there'll be no restrictions to that once the rapid transit lanes are in. It's really just a matter of, of checking for vehicles from both directions, looking for a bus coming westbound, as well as checking um, for eastbound traffic in the traffic lanes, and then making your, your, uh, your turn movement into King Street and heading east from there. So there's no physical barriers that are, that'll prevent that uh, outbound traffic from 380 King going forward. Now we have seen some questions about uh, the removal of King of parking elsewhere on King and I wonder if you could speak to just the, the kind of the, the factors that are considered when designing the configuration and you know the trade-offs between various considerations. Jenny or Ted. <laughs> Um, you could almost take this back to a lot of the things that we thought about at the high level EA stage when we were looking about what are the best routes to locate rapid transit on. Um, in the downtown, we had looked on the east at, at options between King and Dundas and, and where are we going to put those, those options. In either case, there would likely be a situation either on Dundas or King where we would have what we have proposed here with bus lanes on both of the curb lanes. So we knew that in this section, because of the constrained space of the road, this was one of the areas where, where parking would be impacted by the project ultimately. But what we did was then try to look at the bigger picture and say, what are other parking areas in the vicinity of this? And how can we have the least impact on that going forward? Um, other stages of the project, when you get closer to the downtown loop and maybe further out, we have looked for places where we can maintain some parking bays behind the, the um, behind the bus lane so you can cross over it. You'd see the hatch lines and you could enter an actual parking bay. In this particular section, we're so constrained by the streets that there weren't a lot of opportunities to introduce those, but anywhere where we can maintain some on-street parking, we have tried to do that. Thanks, Jenny. Oh, and just the follow-up question was, my point to this query is where do my guests park? So it's a sounds like a question with a specific to the, uh, to the building. I wonder if this we could take this one now, or do we take individual ones? Is, is this Kathy again? Kathy, yep. it's, it's Jeff Kelso here again. Hello. Um, so, um, did want to reassure the properties and the residents uh, who live on both the north and south side of King, right at west of Colburn, that there will be temporary access roads constructed 
such that you'll be able to gain access in and out of those uh, properties. Um, the extent of sewer work there is, there is some sanitary sewer work to be done west of Colburn, but it, it kind of terminates slight, you know, about, I don't know the exact distance, but west of Colburn. So the sewer won't be going through the intersection and therefore we'd be able to have the contractor construct a, a gravel road or, or something along those lines so that, that you guys and everyone who's in those buildings will be able to get in and out of them. And um, we will be able to meet with you and whoever else has more questions about that. Uh, we anticipate that being a thing to do, quite frankly, uh, before construction starts. Uh, we can hear your, your thoughts and concerns and, and, and incorporate that with the contractor so that access is maintained at all times. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we have a question about cycling. And the question is comes from Jason Jordan. Hi, Jason. Um, how should cyclists use King Street with no cycling infrastructure and um, and in some sections there only being one general lane? This could be scary for most. Yes, there is Dundas, but some cyclists will be going to and from properties on King Street also to get the bus um, and to use wanting to use the bike rack. So a question about cycling. Hi, Jason. Yeah. And as I was mentioning on the cycling section of the presentation, we really are trying to encourage people to use the east west spine along Dundas to be able to at least make your main movements through town. And then what we want to do is maybe try to encourage and, and a lot of this is through the education once RT is up and we're operating is to be able to help people understand where are those key bus connection points along King Street where we have a stop. And those would be where we encourage people to use Dundas and then connect down through those cycling, cycling connections along the side streets. Um, obviously, Colburn is one of those key locations where, again, we've got that spine for the east-west is, is Dundas, but then Colburn is also going to be a really critical north-south spine for cycling, and we have an RT stop right there. So our hope is as people start to learn where cycling infrastructure is, they can optimize where they're using that and then try to connect in at those critical points. Thanks, Danny. We have a, a brief lull in questions, and I'm, and I'm hoping I can use this time to shamelessly put out a quick poll here that um, we were hoping to launch just to get a better sense of who's joining us this evening. No pressure to answer this, but here we go. I think I have another one in here too. Thanks everyone, this is great. Seeing lots of responses, good mix of participants this evening. And keep your questions coming, these are really great. If, if you're wondering it, probably someone else in the audience is as well, so. Okay, we have a question about the, um, the property at 323, 363 Colburn Street. Has the team smoke, spoken with the condo board there? Hi, Jersey. I think this might be one for Jeff or Ted. I can start it off. We do have uh, a list of all the key stakeholders along the route that we've been trying to identify and speak to ahead of this meeting. I know they were on our list to get in touch with and we've been trying to reach out. I don't know for sure if we've been able to make that connection, but we've definitely been, we've had like basically a mini slide deck where we've been walking through the basics of the project, what to expect, and then including a few slides that zoom right in on whichever stakeholder or property owner we're meeting with. So we've definitely been trying to make those connections and uh, this is one of the properties that was on our list to reach out to. That is one of the properties I was referring to earlier with these temporary access roads. And yes, I do see that there will be uh, some further coordination required for sure. All right. Oh, that's a good question from Lisa. Um, these are all great questions. Will you start at Wellington or Lyle Street when you begin this uh, project? I have a question about are we going west to east or east to west or how's it going to work? Yeah, I can answer that one, everyone. Um, and so this phase one, we're calling it, is broken down into several smaller phases. Um, the first stage of construction will start at Wellington and work 
um, uh, toward the east. So Wellington will be maintained with one lane in each direction, north south. Basically, we got to start with the sewer connections on the west side of Wellington. So that would mean that the traffic at the onset of construction will be on the east side of Wellington. And then it'll have to flip over to the west side and we work, the contractor will work its way to, to the east. That's not to say that there will be some other mid block startages where the sewer work will pick up and uh, not necessarily go the whole way. Like it was saying, it stops short of Colburn, but then it picks up again further east. So we may phase this so that there's construction happening in different blocks along the way, between, between, all the way between, not all the way, but at different spots between Wellington and Lyle. But we do know for sure that we'll be starting at Wellington. Hopefully Thanks. that's a bit. Um. We have a question about uh, whether there will be any disruption to London District Energy Services, i.e. steam chilled water. Well, we've been coordinating with N-Wave who manages the LDE infrastructure. Um, there's a couple points along the East Corridor where it does overlap. And so we've been working with them to see, um, are there any upgrades to that infrastructure that we can incorporate into our contract? Same as we do with all the other utilities. If we're gonna be going in and disrupting the road, we wanna fix everything that needs to be fixed when we're there at the same time. So I think it's a little bit of work that uh, we're near by the TD Towers. And, and again, Colburn, there's a bit of LDE infrastructure along the Colburn Path. So we're definitely coordinating with them to make sure that we can integrate any work that needs to happen and, and make sure we're not having disruptions. Thanks, Jenny. I can, I can add a little more techie stuff to that, Jenny. So there is two chilled water lines that feed uh, and serve the city center uh, at the northeast corner of Wellington and King. And there's approximately 80 meters of 500 millimeter diameter chilled water lines that'll be replaced so that it will provide a running line for the new new storm sewer that's got to get constructed. So the the on the, the scheduling for that work needs to be done and completed in the uh, early spring so that uh, the chilled water is back up and running so the air conditioning units can be um, working for that building uh, when the when the seasons require it basically mid-April basically. So yes, it'll be one of the first things that they do or need to do. We have a question about um, the, the painting of the BRT lanes and uh, what is the reason for not painting the entire length of the BRT lanes in, in red, um, as it could be confusing with the portions that are meant for mixed traffic or for turning lanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are doing that approach in the downtown loop because it's just such a busy area. We've got, uh, there'll be, with RT and local buses, there'll be a bus almost every 90 seconds along the, the downtown loop portion. Um, in this area, as we get out into the corridors for both east and the south, we looked to best practices and a lot of other municipalities that have implemented rapid transit programs. And also cost is a big factor. It's very expensive to paint those red lanes. So we really want to kind of make sure we're focused on the areas where you've got conflict points, decision points that need to be made by drivers. Um, I think that also uh, there's not just the painting on the lanes themselves. In the areas where there isn't red paint, there's still going to be the diamond and the bus only text that you can see. So it, it's not like it's not going to be apparent that if the red paint's there, it's not a bus lane. Plus there'll also be, by bylaw, we're required to have overhead signage that marks a dedicated lane. So you'll there'll be quite a bit of, of indicators out there to clearly know that it's a dedicated bus lane. And I think uh, they'll also have a lot of education that we're doing at about the time that we start to um, bring these into operation. Great. We do have a follow-up question as to whether we can provide examples of where this has been done elsewhere. Do we, can we point to any other municipalities that would use the mixed approach? Jeff. Oh, someone might there we go. Yeah. hurry it up. <laughs> <laughs> That's my son. Um, we had a couple examples. We've been on this for over an hour. Excuse me. 
The, uh, there's some examples from uh, Viva system in York region. Um, there's also examples in Toronto and Ottawa where they've used a similar approach. Etobicoke, we've seen them in, in busier streets where they've got upwards of 10,000 vehicles a day where they're using a, a mixture of red at the key points and just signage and diamond patterns on the pavement in the areas where you're in the mid block portion of the street. And I'll just add Jenny in London. We have them at uh, Wonderland and Sarnia as well too. So that's a local example. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, I've got a question about, uh, will there be pedestrian scale lighting along King Street? I wonder if that's one that we can point to Rick for, if it's still available. Here, I'm back, thanks. <clears throat> um, I know there uh, the uh, lighting will be um, uh, high mass uh, lighting. Uh, there was an example on that uh, on the slide uh, for the streetscape. <clears throat> so uh, they're taller uh, poles, they're pole top um, uh, fixtures uh, that will provide enough light for the street and the sidewalks. Thank you. You bet. The great questions, everyone. All this information uh, will be available on the website, um, but we'll also be taking questions through the site as well, and of course, through email. So tonight's not the only opportunity. Can we look at the block with the station? Jersey, could you just tell us um, specifically which one you're referring to? Sorry, East of Colburn. Okay, let me see here. Apologies, it's just taking a sec there. Here's the east of Colburn block. So Colburn to Burwell Street here. And we see the Colburn Street Station on the north yeah, this side. Is an it, this is an interesting block along the East Corridor where um, this is the portion where between Colburn and Burwell, we transition down from two general traffic lanes to a single general traffic lane heading eastbound. Um, and because of the short distance in these, this block, we we're able to stagger the two RT bus stops, eastbound and westbound, so that we can kind of reduce our, our impacts to property and allow some opportunities for some additional streetscaping within that area. So it's a, it's a, it's a neat area. I think when this block is built, it's gonna look really cool. I, I, again, it brings something up that I don't think has been said yet today, guys, and uh, that has to do with uh, some of the uh, the London hydro servicing that will become underground servicing um, instead of some of the hydro poles that you'll see there now. Some of the it's not constant from Wellington to Lyle, but some of these hydro poles will disappear and the servicing becomes underground. And the reason I mention that it goes back to that question about lighting, where new street lights will replace. What you may see there now is a hydro pole with a street light on it and um, try to like make it a little, little fancier where some of those poles and overhead wires are going to go away. Thanks, Jeff. We have a question about um, the street markings again. What is the reasoning for leaving the asphalt in the hatch portion of the street? I don't quite understand the question, Jersey. What do you mean by? The hat, like where the red paint goes into the hatched lines, is that what you're referring to? Can we just type a yes, maybe in the Q and I, I assume the question is why is it not continuous and it's broken dash lines like that, Jenny? And it's a good question because um, it may not be implicit. But basically, I think the answer to that would be uh, that's where we people will travel through the RT lane, the rapid transit, to get into and out of various properties or. Or residences or whatever. Yeah, I think. Okay, I think maybe he's referring to the white zebra hatching that is the pedestrian crossings at the intersections. Um, in these renderings, they're pretty high level. Um, if you looked at some of the images that we had in the streetscaping, you can notice that we're planning on at any of these locations where there's a stop, the pedestrian crossing and that zebra would be uh, actually an enhanced one that has sort of colored marking and almost like a, an enhanced crossing to really kind of point out that this is an RT stop, 
No, north of the car lane. Oh, oh. I have find the question here. Um, the white hatch. Yeah, I think that's what Jenny's talking about is those pedestrian crossings. Uh, you'll notice that nowadays that the city puts in the, the, the two foot wide hatch, hatch marks at each of the uh, pedestrian crossings. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, Jersey, or not. No, I figured it out. Yeah, if you look under the word King Street on this rendering, in the asphalt section, you can see there's a, a painted hatched area there that we've shown as, um, so that's sort of a shadow marking that when you're across on the opposite, I guess would be on the west side of Colburn, you've got two lanes. And on the east side of Colburn, we're starting to transition down to one lane. In that transition space as the pavement width narrows, we've shown um, white hatching in there. And uh, I think that's maybe sort of why we left it as asphalt, maybe not put something like a landscaped island or other different options. Um, I think at this point, it probably was due to some of the maintenance requirements if that was a fully landscaped area. But I don't know, Jeff, if you can maybe speak to why we chose to leave that as hatched versus maybe some other type of, of treatment to taper off that shadow lane. Uh, the way I recall it, Jenny, it had something to do with at one point there was consideration of that being a median island or like you mentioned, a landscaped island, but with plows and not like the uh, the crossing over through the lanes, it was a, an operations concern. But it's like Jenny said, on the, the west side of Colburn, you get two lanes turning into one lane that goes east of Colburn. And that that other lane turn is for a left turn lane to head north on, on, on Colburn. So if you're heading east, then you have to the one lane turns north and the other one goes through. So hopefully that helps a bit, but uh, yeah, there, it does come down to, I believe it's a, the, the, the distance for an operating plow blade, uh, I believe was a concern with that, as I recall. Thanks, Jeff. We have a question about um, some of the social issues that we can see on some of these projects and how we would manage some of those um, some of the undesirable behaviors that you may see um, from people perhaps experiencing mental health crises or um, experiencing homelessness. We have seen activities in the past. Um, this individual has flagged that they noticed during the King Street construction, uh, if there are loose rocks, construction equipment available to uh, individuals, um, it can become damaged um, as well as windows, um, especially in the evenings. This is, uh, an yeah, Jenny, will you take yeah. this one? Sure, we've, we've learned a lot from working in the core over the last few years, and especially um, the last year where I work on King Street and Old East Village, um, kind of dealing with some of the social issues we've been out there. And we, we've pulled together a team for these projects, including um, community informed response, working with London Police Services to kind of help be able to uh, respond to issues compassionately when we do see things like that happening on the job site. Um, we've also really kind of bumped up our security in a lot of cases. In many of these construction sites, you'll see the, the fencing that goes up. And when we have the road open for like the, the real heavy construction where there's digging and a lot of vehicles, and we protect that by putting up this fencing. But it's also a way that we can kind of contain any of the construction materials and any sort of debris that's in works within those areas. And it's a big part of the project to make sure that outside those areas, we've got clear, clean pedestrian walking spaces. So you know, it kind of removes some of those opportunities to be able to pick up maybe debris from the construction site. It's really important that we keep things contained within that area. And so those are the some of the things that we've built on as we've experienced construction through the last year in the core areas. And, and we even have um, some roles that we're trying to add in, almost like a, a site ambassador type role that can, can help keep an eye on those things, make sure the fencing is up and the wayfinding's in place. And we're really being conscious of of staying on top of those aspects of the job and, and maintaining that. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, we have a question about uh, opportunities for public art. Um, uh, Debbie has asked, maybe I missed it, but what, what are the considerations for public art uh, and perhaps engaging local artists? Yeah, we definitely are coordinating with um, with our culture office and opportunities and it's sort of a separate initiative for actual 
public art placements. But one of the things I had mentioned during the section about the station designs was the idea of including some, some blank canvas area within our station and stops that we're looking to have some sort of program where there'd be an opportunity to add some customizations, engage or have programs where we could use local artists to be able to draw on some of the, um, some of the characteristics of the neighborhood that each stop is in and, and tie it to its surroundings and its community. So that, that's definitely something that we wanna work with. Um, with the stops coming in, they're gonna be following later and not necessarily all at once. So we'll be able to kind of work through some plans to be able to utilize that space as we go. And we wanna kind of keep our, our opportunities open to have some, some fun possibilities on how we use that, that space within the station design. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, we have a question about, um, the, I'm gonna to go to this slide actually, uh, whether there will be a left turn lane north onto Adelaide. Just trying to get over to that one. So I'm a lay person, but it looks like. <laughs> That's a good question, but yeah, you're right. There will be left turns permitted onto Adelaide Street off of King. So that is a, a provision for this intersection. Uh, uh, Jersey, if the question is, is it a designated left turn lane? Uh, not necessarily, it's a through lane and a left turn lane uh, just west of, of Adelaide. Hmm. When it comes to intersections with rapid transit, how we phase those intersections is really important. And what you end up having is the rotation of each intersection phase tends to have a phase for each group. There'll be a bus phase and there'll be a car phase. There'll be a right turn phase. And what we do is try to give everybody their space within the intersection to be able to make their different movements. Thank you both. It hasn't been said here yet, but usually if there's a turn, a designated turn lane, the arrows get to, you know identified on the on the plans. If it's a through lane or or something of the like, we don't put like a straightforward arrow. It's implied that that's the route of travel on that lane. Um, the RT lanes are slightly different than that. You'll notice that in the the bottom left of that figure, it says bus only, or there's these diamonds. You'll see those. And I think Ted mentioned it earlier that there's these uh, overhead signs that will be mounted on these tall posts or poles that identify where the uh, where the, the RT lane is, is designated compared to other places. <clears throat> oh, we have another question here. Is the connection between York and King east of Adelaide being removed? I think you're talking about the slip lane that heads north onto Adelaide. Is that what's being asked? Yeah, I believe that's uh, the question there. Um, okay. Yeah. There, there is. Uh, I don't know if we have the the next slide over, Andrea. Yeah. Let me just see here. Because I believe the answer to that question is that slip lane that becomes a basically a dead end street with access to the properties on the east side of what exists there now. And mm. to the church. Does that show? Is it in this area here that you're describing? Yeah, okay. uh, it doesn't really yeah, so show it that great. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just and off the drawing. Too. You're right, Jeff. Um, so just immediately south of that garden, it does terminate. And the, the reason being is that there's a lot of the, the, the intersection in itself is a very complicated intersection in terms of uh, you're accommodating transit those those regular vehicle moments, but just to accommodate what was once that lane. Would have been very difficult in terms of operations uh, for signalization so it was removed with this project yeah. Yeah. street intersection king is going to look a lot different after this project has been constructed yeah. that might be an understatement <laughs> um a question about the stops and stations and some of the features that they'll have what are the considerations or plans for real-time bus arrival information, transit info, bus occupancy, uh, et cetera, within each transit stop? I can pass this to Jenny or Katie. Either. 
Katie, would, would you be yep. able to share sure. to this one? Thank you. Yeah. So um, we will have um, information signs at all of the um, transit stations. They will be um, similar to what we have started to install um, across the system in some of our transit stops. So they would have um, digital displays that would show the next bus arrival information. There is also plans for maps um, and other transit info to be displayed um, near the ticket vending machines. Um, bus occupancy likely would not be something that would be displayed at the stops, but that is something that is, is available um, online on our real-time um, information session through our website. Um, on, at this point, I don't think that's something that we can currently make available at the station stops, but it is good input that we can look at into um, to see if that would be something that we would be able to provide actually at the stations. We have a question about um, construction beginning on the Wellington Gateway. Um, when will the construction on Wellington start between Dundas and Wellington. Yeah, that, that oh sorry. That, that, right. that project is proposed for 2023. So you're talking to downtown loop phase three, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's 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 proposed 2023. At this point, we're around 50 to 90 percent design. So we're we're still on target for 2023 construction. Um, uh, uh, oh, did, uh, did I, uh, you know, I don't know who's asking that question or where they live or work, but um, the first part of that project will start at York toward King and then King toward Dundas, then Dundas to Queens is how that would, would get built in case anyone's wanting to get more specific. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Uh, a question about signal priority. Will buses have signal priority along the entire BRT corridor? I mean, the full corridors will be equipped with transit signal priority. Um, that essentially means that if a bus is coming and it's moving along its schedule, it really doesn't change too much. If it is a little bit behind schedule, it might hold the green a little bit longer to help it catch up. But uh, it's really not something that's very obvious to somebody that would be driving. You kind of get a little bit of a green wave depending on the, the road. But for the most part, it's really just trying to be that little bit extra to help us to stay on their schedule. And then another question about uh, traffic operations and um, whether we're concerned that traffic blocking King going east because of cars stopped to turn left. Yeah, is there, is there any concern about traffic blocking King going east because of cars that are stopped to turn left north onto Adelaide? Especially since now people who would normally have turned north from York would also have to take King. Um, I don't think so because when people are making that through or left turn movement eastbound on King, there's no, there wouldn't be oncoming traffic. We would have the, the signal would control any, any westbound buses from coming through. So it's not like having to wait for oncoming traffic to be able to make that left turn lane. It would be a dedicated phase for through traffic and left traffic to be able to continue and keep that flowing. So it should flow fairly well. Great question, and, and we still have a few, quite a few participants. So um, the rest of our audience must find these helpful as well. So keep them coming, folks.
I wonder if it's worth speaking in the meantime to some of the um, questions we've received ahead of the PIC about that ContraFlow bus, uh, bus lane, just as it's new infrastructure, it's something that uh, the community is going to have to get used to and um, just uh, what that might mean for properties on the north side, making those exits, um, any sort of, I know we've heard um, we heard from, uh, we've been in discussions with the school about opportunities to provide um, lots of education. And this is maybe a piece I can speak to is that with any of our new infrastructure that we're starting to introduce throughout the city, um, whether it's protected um, cycling intersections uh, with some of those uh, new buffers that we have in place, there's lots of education that goes into it to kind of prime the public um, and, and let folks know well in advance before it's up and running. Um, so so with we'll be working with uh, with stakeholders along here with residents, schools, businesses, depending on what the need may be, whether it's uh, additional enhanced signage uh, within a parking garage to give advanced heads up um, to, to keep an eye out for oncoming uh, traffic or uh, working with the students at, at Beale Secondary to make sure that they're aware as pedestrians and, and, this, uh, and leaving their property uh, at the end of the school day. Uh, it'll be really important to work closely with everyone to make sure that they're aware of how this works. Always a bit of a learning curve at the start. Thanks. I've heard a comment from Thanks, Jersey. We uh, appreciate your support and, and your great questions tonight. And I, I hear your comment about um, lots of residents that are very keen in your building to learn more and to make sure that we're working together on this. So we'll most definitely be in touch very soon. Thank you. It is going to be a big construction project, that's for sure, for next year. For those of you who know much about construction or not, uh, it's going to be a, a good one. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's where the coordination piece, it, just behind the scenes, hearing hearing all the teams coming together citywide with all the construction happening in the core, making sure that the staging and all the traffic control plans are so intricately thought through and, and ahead of the 2022 season. I know it's very much top of mind for everyone to make sure it goes as smoothly as possible. We are starting to see a bit of drop off uh, in participants. Um, still, still quite a few on here, so we're still here. If you have anything else you'd like to comment on or ask about, Maybe I'll speak as well while, while we've got a bit of a quiet period to the construction dollars. We also heard some questions ahead of uh, tonight's public meeting about um, eligibility for the construction dollars. I'm sure many of you have seen those on social media. There's all kinds of great initiatives that the BIAs and their members have, um, have held contests and giveaways to really promote basically free money to spend in the core at, at some of our awesome shops and businesses and, and um, artisans. And so uh, we did get some questions from uh, businesses that are located in kind of the in-between zone, the midtown area between the BIAs about whether they'd be eligible. And yes, everyone, just to confirm, everyone located in the core area, um, which this project covers, will be eligible for construction dollars. And um, we're working with the BIAs who administer the program to figure out how to best uh, absorb those kind of in-between businesses. You know, if you're closer to Old East Village, perhaps it makes sense to um, have them redeemed there or and to pick them up there and so working through those details but we'll have that sorted and in the meantime just wanted to convey that yes you are definitely eligible for the program and will be included in it um, yeah oh. 
Oh, may I ask one more question that I think I'd heard in our earlier conversations with stakeholders? It was around whether we'll be using 24 seven construction at any point or in any areas of the project. Do we know anything about that? Can we speak to that at all? Um, what we've done is um, when we do go out for tender, we're gonna put some clear language in there that requires the successful contractor to have a construction staging workshop with us um, once they're fully executed and, and on board. And a big part of that is looking at our options to try to move this along. As Jeff said, this is a very large project. Um, it, we're really kind of doing our best to optimize some of the blocks that don't have as much underground and some that do and and again maintain access but there may be opportunities where for key intersections or some areas we might want to come in hit it fast and get out so um, we, we haven't completely pinned that down but we have definitely put some language into the contract to sit down with the contractor once we have them on board and come up with a really just specific plan and so when we have the pre-construction meeting in the spring we'll be able to share those plans with everybody, kind of break down this project into its stages and its sub stages, explain where we'll keep one lane open, where we might have to do closures and what that means for access. So like, like Andrew said, all the nitty gritty, we'll, we'll have that for you in the spring when we come back because by then we'll have our contractor on board. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah, I can also add to that a bit, uh, everyone. So um, part of the challenges with construction is some of these connections that have to happen and um, in particular where we have water service connections i do know that the um, the contract will indicate that the work will need to be done at night in the hours between 2 and 6 a.m so that would be interesting to those of you who otherwise would not want to have the water shut off um, during the day so that is definitely planned work there is a lot of water service work to be done here and it, it is already known to be nighttime work that will happen. Thanks, Jeff. I think that uh, wraps up our Q&A session, um, but that's not the end of the dialogue between our team by any means. If you have any other questions or things that occur to you later on that you want to express to us about the project, please feel free to visit our Get Involved website. Um, it's getinvolved.london.ca slash East London link. And we'd be pleased to answer those questions and receive your comments. Thank you all very much for your participation today. Uh, this is really a, a, a unique project that's going to um, really benefit the area. And we're very excited to get moving on it and, uh, and to work in partnership with you throughout. So thank you all. And uh, I hope you have a good evening. <laughs>